Smell that? It's time for a swing dance reaction video. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Street Smart Swing. My name is Jamin Jackson, also known as the Galactic Swing Dance Umpire. <laughs> And I am super excited to be scrutinizing another Lindy Hop competition. I'm gonna tell you right now, folks, I'm super excited about this one because this is in Korea, one of my favorite places to go dancing in the world. The event's called AJW 2020. It looks like it's going to be a solo jazz open competition. You never know what you're gonna get in the open division, and I'm gonna tell you exactly what I was looking for at the conclusion of the competition. So let's get right into it! All right, let's get into this one. I know the audience is gonna be into it. They are so hyped in Korea. I'm gonna try not to scream too loud in excitement and blow your eardrums out in your headphones. Okay, so <clears throat> I gotta tell you where my eyes are gravitating to first. Uh, I'm gonna have to say my eyes are naturally going to the gentleman uh, with the tan pants on right in front of me. I think he's like number 85, really big guy. He's got a jacket on. Uh, and the, the lady who had the red, dr ah, red dress, she's going first. So let's see what happens. They, they were the main two that caught my attention. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Come on. Hey! 
Alright, I guess <clears throat> this might be the second round. Are they going to speed it up? Hey! Alright, here we go. Yes, this was hard. This was hard to judge, guys. Oh boy, let's talk about it. So this one was a really interesting battle. I will tell you, I first have to go to the common denominator when I am judging a solo jazz competition. And what is that common denominator? Well, one must ask the question, why does something look solo jazz if it's rooted in improvisation? There has to be a coherent reason why I would judge something good versus judging something bad. There has to be an ultimate standard. And so a lot of people don't actually clarify what that is, nor do they really know in many cases. We just kind of feel when it's off based on what we see. So out of all the years I've been dancing, aside from <clears throat> vintage swing dancing, 
I did other styles. And I can tell you why those styles look the way they looked. And with solo jazz specifically, when dancers isolate the torso, and I talk about this a lot, when they're able to do that, it makes their movements look like it's from the 1920s to the 40s. And the reason is, is because there was a significant amount of tap influence at the time that really kind of shaped and molded many of the vernacular movements of that time. So that's my starting point. And I will tell you, the majority of these dancers nailed that. Most of them understood keeping the body quiet. And I could identify them if I had a silhouette of their body as dancers who were probably vintage dancers. Easy. So if that is the case, if they all could do it, then what am I actually judging then? Is it actually fair for me to judge them then if they all could isolate the upper body? Well, yeah, but I have to tell you all that it's a lot of it is subjective. I'm going to say the rest of what I have to talk about is the subjective values that I have when I'm looking at a competition, particularly solo jazz, because this is a lot about <clears throat> balancing the inimitable aspects of who that dancer is with those fundamental things that we can we cannot abandon. There just has to be a, a, a mix of those things done so well that it, it makes them stand out uniquely, but it also says, hey, I can identify what that dance is. So for me, when I look at competitions like this in Korea, it's a different level. I can't just, I, usually I go to the common denominator and see if people can isolate their upper body, but since everybody was doing it here, the second thing I go to is I look for ingenuity. I immediately go to the person who is unique, different. And I don't mean just different in the way they look, per se, the shapes. They might do some different shapes, but I'm also interested in the rhythms that they choose to emphasize musically. That gets into the timing aspect. And so for me, I picked three dancers for three separate reasons. These three uh, are the top three for me. They're, they're, the, they're number one for certain reasons, but there's one that's number one for all the right reasons that I was looking for. So all three of these dancers had control, but only one of these dancers had the element that I was really looking for. And so let me start with the third place for me. The third place dancers for me was the she had... Uh, a green shirt on with like black pants and blue shoes. What I loved about her, clearly she had the control aspect of solo jazz, but she had this energy that was there and she had this confidence that said, maybe I should pay attention a little more to her because I might not know what's going to happen with all that energy that's being portrayed uh, on her face in the attitude. What I also liked was her choreography. She had some really well-timed uh, movements that fit the music perfectly. Now, again, that's something that's my personal preference. Um, I like to see order. I like to see choreography in certain extents. But at the same time, I see that this part of her strength also hurt her in my eyes. I think if she, if she would have not had everything feeling as if it was choreographed, I probably would have had her higher because for me... I, I, look, I look a lot for the elements that the musicians have in dancers. Here's what I mean by that. If I, a musician is playing in time with the rhythm section, like a, let's say it's a saxophone player and it's time for their solo, they're not going to just sit there and do the same notes to the same song the exact same way every time. They're going to take up that space you know, it could be 12 bars, 32 bars, whatever they're going to improvise. And, and they'll just kind of improvise based on how they're feeling. And I think that is an incredibly important part of, of jazz dance, particularly vintage jazz dance, is that we cannot lose the element of improvisational creativity. That is intrinsic to the idea of what jazz is. Call and response, but kind of making things happen as you go. So when things are overly processed and overly packaged and presented in a way that's super clean and formatted and optimized, it feels like um, it feels like theater. It feels like musical theater. It feels like 
they're presenting something to me that's already ready and we we don't have the element of vulnerability and uh, and expectations not uh being predicted we don't have that i want to see what's going to happen next and feel a little bit of fear not knowing if they're going to make it on time or hit it on beat so she for me was the best when it came to the craftsmanship and arranging her movements Plus, I could identify many of those classic movements. So shout out to her. She was amazing. I, I could feel her attitude. And I love that. I love that. Um, let me move to my second place. The reason this person was in second place was tough. <clears throat> this was tough because I wanted to give this person first place, but it wasn't really for the right reasons. This person was the follower, the girl who had green shoes on. I think she... Yeah, she had green shoes on and she was doing maybe a little bit of tap too. I think she had some tap skills that she was mixing with uh, a lot of her vintage jazz moves. Now, I use those words interchangeably like jazz and tap because of the same things. But I, I say that in a way so that you can understand that I'm drawing a distinction between uh, two different genres. Not to say that they don't bleed over sometimes, but that's the point. Is sometimes they should bleed over, but not the whole time. And I felt she had the Susie Q's down. But when it came to just doing some other basic jazz movements that the third place person had, she highlighted her tapping ability. And I thought, yes, she has some crazy rhythms. The timing was there on the rhythms. The improvisation was there. And I like to see that. I like to see a higher level of skill set being integrated with a lot of the traditional solo jazz movements. So I, I had to rate her a little bit higher be, just because she was different, just because she added some tap dancing in there and it wasn't sloppy. It wasn't like, look, I'm a Lindy Copper and I'm gonna put on some tap shoes. That was like a Bill Cosby accent. Is it okay to imitate Bill Cosby? It's too soon, maybe, it's too soon. But anyway. She was doing that, and, and but she wasn't doing it in that corny way where the, the dancers aren't actually good at tap, but because we know them and we're, everybody knows their name and they're good dancers, they put on tap shoes and you're just like, yay! And it's like, okay, you know, it's like my child's recital. But I get it when people want to practice, you know, and, and inspire people to say, hey, maybe you should keep working on different dance styles. That's good. But when it's not good, I'm going to call you on it. But she was not that type of dancer. I could tell she was disciplined. She had her rhythms tight. She came out there. She did some of the solo jazz movements, but she integrated it with some other tap movements. And I think that's good for this specific genre because it helps people understand that it bleeds over into other things that were popular during that time period. So anyway, she got second place for me. <clears throat> Now, my first place winner. My first place winner uh, was almost my second place winner. But I liked the fact that he had the balance of all of these things. He didn't necessarily do any tap, but he had the improvisational elements to his set and the control to not make it look like he was messing up that made me go, okay, I can watch him when it's choreographed and it will probably be legit. I could watch him with nothing choreographed and he's willing to listen to the instruments and augment his movement a little bit to match it and totally be comfortable while in that process. Um, I can see the timing of what he was doing. There was, there was no rushing. He didn't mind repeating a phrase and then mixing it up a little bit and then abandoning his plan to match the timing of the music. That is the full package that I like to look for. I want to see choreography, but I also want to see vulnerability and flexibility, working with the music as you're going along with it. I think that is, for me, that is the spirit of jazz at its best. And when I can look through a dancer, when I'm watching them, I can tell if it's choreographed. I can tell. And a lot of what he was doing was not choreographed. That part's huge. Plus, um, I can't penalize him for not doing tap. The reason I put him first is because his vintage jazz movements were more, there was a bigger variety of movements. 
He wasn't just doing one Suzy Q and then breaking out in time steps and slides. He was doing many of the vernacular jazz movements that we would associate with authentic jazz without completely going tap with that. And I love the, the second place winner for me who got who did the tap. I just think he was more balanced in his approach to what he was doing. And his balance wasn't necessarily with tap. His balance was with a little bit of choreography, a little bit of timing with the music, with that choreography. And then he totally abandoned certain things and just went with it. But he also had the control part that many of these dancers all had. He had it in a very, very dominant way. And I, I appreciated his dancing. Um, so that's, that's what I had to say about this one, guys. What did you all think about this open solo jazz competition? I'll tell you, it's not easy judging these competitions when it comes to the subjective elements of it. Because for me, I want to feel something, but I also want to look at something critically to see if, if all of those elements are there to create a, an inimitable balance. I want to see a chaotic balance of a unique fingerprint, but it's balanced. Right. Not just a bunch of crazy stuff. We call it jazz. And then everybody's like, that was cool because the person is famous, but it, it may not actually be well balanced. Right. I don't like that, but I like balance. Not everybody valid, uh, validates balance in their dancing and they're still good. But for me, I want to feel something. I want to hear something with the music. I want to see the music amplified through those dancers. And I want to have that that uh, connection hit me in an emotional way. And I felt these dancers had that balance. So shout out to everybody who got into this competition. It's not easy getting up in front of a group of people and everybody judging you and people screaming and, and the potential of you just messing up and it being all over the internet. So big shout out to everybody who got out there and performed. Those are my three winners. Let me know who you thought should have won this solo jazz competition. If you guys are wanting to learn how to do these movements and you've never done it before, check out some of my free courses below um, where I break down a lot of the vintage solo jazz routines along with some modern routines. And then I explain why, why certain things look a certain way to give you a little bit more confidence to get the structure under your belt so that then you can start improvising in a way that's more unique and meaningful to you. That's what we wanna see more is who you are and the Lindy Hop community to inspire me and many other dancers in the future who are not even born yet. Think about that, some deep stuff. But anyway, let me know what you guys thought about this competition in the comment section. If I don't see you guys in one of my uh, free classes online, hopefully I get a chance to see you in the next reaction video. Take care.